Joy comes in the morning. What great words of hope and anticipation. We're living in a day and age where so many of us are facing difficulties, suffering, and all kinds of obstacles that prevent us from really experiencing the joy of the Lord. It's not as though God's joy is not available to us abundantly. It's that oftentimes we allow those circumstances to prevent us from praising God in the midst of the trial. We're going to do a three-week mini-series, taking a break from Kingdom Parables. We'll do this throughout the entire series of Kingdom Parables, but these three weeks, we're going to look at Psalms 30, 31, and 32. The series is called Free Indeed, and we're going to be looking at today how to be free from the suffering through praise. We're going to be looking at these three psalms, which are couched in book one of Psalms. Psalms is 150 different psalms. They've got all kinds of authors that wrote these psalms or songs or poems, if you will. It's a collection of these poetic words. Uh, King David's attributed for most of them. He's not the only author, though. Twelve came from King Asaph, the songs of Korah. There's eleven from them, two from Herman and Ethan, Solomon and Moses gave three, and 49 of them are just completely anonymous. And each of these psalms that are written, they're meant to evoke some kind of emotion. Um, after the exile, all of these writings from the past, they were compiled and put together. They were brought together in these sections. Psalms 1 and 2 kind of start the fringe of the first part of book 1 that leads us all the way up to book 5 within Psalms as they're categorized. Book 5 is that alphabetic book near the end of the book, followed by Psalms 150, a, a song of joyful proclamation. So you see the beginning of the book in Psalms 1 telling us how blessed a person's life can be if they follow the Lord. Psalm 2 gives us this future hope for a Messiah, that our eyes should be looked, looking towards a future Savior to save us. And the last Psalm talks about the praise of the people of God coming before Him. Most of these Psalms that we see here in this book, they're broken up into two kind of main sections, a lament or a praise. There's others, but these are the two main categories. And Psalms 30 kind of walks that fine line of in and out of what could have been a lament, but it really is focusing in on it being a psalm of praise. A psalm of praise because of the faithfulness of God. A call to God's people to praise Him for His goodness. Psalms 30 in particular is actually a song of David for the building of the house of David in Jerusalem. <laughs> he went through a lot to get to the place of king. Remember, he was chosen and anointed to be king. But there needed to be some equipping to take place. And during that season of equipping, there was this moment of David questioning whether or not God's favor was on him. There were enemies that wanted to kill him, take him off of the face of the earth. They were jealous of him. King Saul was not pleased with David any longer. And David turns the corner here. This home that he builds, it's kind of a reflection of what God had taken him through. And he rejoices. He rejoices because he knows full well that the favor of the Lord was upon him. And if it wasn't for God during those difficult times, that he wouldn't be where he is today. And so he sings a song of praise. He sings a song of praise after building this house, the house that was even supplied by King Hiram, who sent envoys of people. He brought cedar, 
wood. He brought carpenters, stonemasons in, all to build this house. And so now outsiders are not looking to him as an enemy, but they're in fact helping him accomplish his goals. Let's read Psalm 30 together. It's 12 verses. It'll feel a little longer, but Psalms are poems. They're writings. They are meant to be read and understood together. It says, I will exalt you, Lord, because you have lifted me up, and you have not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. Verse 3 says, Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You spared me from among those going down to the pit. Verse 4 tells us to sing to the Lord, you, his faithful ones, and praise his holy name. For his anger, it lasts a moment, but his favor, a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. When I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain. When you hid your face, I was terrified. I called to you and sought favor from my Lord. Well, what gain is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your truth? Lord, listen and be gracious to me. Lord, be my helper. You turned my lament into dancing, and you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. In this psalm, we've broken it up into several different sections. Verses 1 through 3 show us the, the first element that David wants to explain to us during his time of praise to the Lord for the building of his house. And this is an element that we should all tap into for our own lives. Like, I think we've all been in places where we need a comeback. We need to recover. And this section is, it's a praise, it's a psalm of recovery. Verses 1 through 3, it's a praise for recovery. Let's look again. It says, I will exalt you, Lord, because you have lifted me up and not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You spared me from among those going down to the pit. This is a, a praise of recovery. David was tired of being tired. He was sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? Maybe you've all been there. And in this moment, he says, I'm going to turn my heart from suffering to praise. Through pain, I'm going to praise God. In the midst of my trial, I'm going to find my triumph in the Lord God. And this is a, a praise of recovery. He says, I will extol thee, O Lord, in one version of the Bible. Another passage, as we see here in the CSB, says, I will exalt. And what you and I might be more familiar with is just the term, I will praise. We don't often use it in daily language of exalting or extolling praise to someone, but that's what David is doing here. He is praising God. The Psalms is here is clearly exalting God, extolling, praising the Lord because he has ultimately been saved from the pit of death, from his experiences of deliverance, from God's chastening of his sin in his life. David praised the Lord. He praised the Lord because, as we see here, his anger does not last. That it's momentary. It's temporary. But his favor for the believer, it is eternal. It's forever. It's permanent. We can use 
praise as a tool to fight back the darkness in our life. We can use praise as that reminder to refocus us, to reframe our lives when things are not going well. I want to ask you a few questions here, just a little self-assessment to get you thinking about praise here. Now, we're talking about specifically the act of of verbally praising God here. Yes, we can live a life style of praise through our actions, but we're, we're talking about actually putting words to it, either through song, through psalm, or, or through speaking, that, that we are praising God with our lips here. And so my question to you, the first one is, how often do you praise God? How often do you take time to praise God? Is it just on Sundays? Do you find moments where you're singing in the shower? As you lay your head to sleep, do you have a soft song on your lips that you sing to the Lord? In your moments of victory or defeat, are you rejoicing in song to the Lord? Do you praise God regularly? Which really makes you frame it this way. The next question, do you praise God outside of the church? Or is it just on Sunday mornings? Or is it just when you watch online and you close in a song of praise to God? Does praising God, does it come naturally to you? Some people it does. For others, they've got to work on it. They have to be intentional about it. It's not as easy for them. So does it come natural to you or is it difficult? When is your preferred time to praise? Your preferred time to praise. Is it when things are going well? When you're just on the cruise control? Or when things are going tough? When do you find yourself praising God as as your preferred season or moment in life to praise Him. You know, there can be some great beneficial impact, uh, things that can impact you when you praise God. There's some great benefits to praising God. There's a huge impact on your life when you praise God. See, I believe praising God, it takes the focus off of ourselves and it puts it on God. It gives you the proper framework. It gives you the proper focus in your life. Praising God takes the spotlight off of you and places it upon the Lord. See, the more we think about ourselves and our problems and the difficulties we're facing, and the more we dwell on that, honestly, the worse it becomes in our mind. But when we praise God... It totally eliminates even the opportunity to dwell on the difficulty. It does. With your lips, singing to God, magnifying God, putting the spotlight on Him, worshiping Him, gives you no room to complain, gives you no room to dwell on the difficulty, gives you no room to whine, gives you no room to be angry at God. You're not providing space in your mind for those elements to take place. Now, there is space in your life where you will go through times of difficulty. You will feel like you're dwelling on something. You're suffering. You're acknowledging that you you have anger. These are emotions, in fact, that God has given you. And the thing that praise does, though, is even if it's just a break for a moment, it takes your focus off of the difficulty. It takes it off of the problem, and it places it properly upon God. Praising God, it, it sets you free, even for just a moment, from the heaviness of this world and the brokenness in this world. Recently, I attended the funeral of 18-year-old Kylie Wilson. 
My friend Scott and his uh, and, and Karina Wilson, their child, Kylie, she lived a good life. I was just an attendee. I wasn't officiating the funeral. But as I sat there, I heard stories of a young lady who ultimately would die from cancer. And in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of pain, she turned her heart towards praise. They were so kind to read some of her journal entries to those in attendance celebrating her life. And those journal entries, they turned from pain to praise. This little girl was an evangelist. She shared her faith. She lived it out. And even through the struggle, she praised God. And I found myself weeping at this funeral for, yes, a, a young lady that I did know and her parents who I knew way better. But as I was weeping, I was thinking about the life well lived. And, and it was actually tears filled with joy for what those in the audience could do if they lived like Kylie. It even brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it right now. That God was glorified through this young girl's life. And in her suffering, she turned to praise. And yes, my weeping, my sadness, my mourning was met with joy. I renewed in my own heart and my spirit a commitment to God to seek after Him in times of trouble and to let my life be spent for the glory of God. I remember singing the song in this worship service of a funeral of God's goodness running after me. And I held on tight to God's goodness and I sung about God's goodness and His faithfulness. In the midst of difficulty, I found hope, hope in God. Verse 3 of chapter 30 here, it says, Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You brought me up from Sheol. Verse 1 says, he's lifted up, right? It says that God would lift him up and not allow his enemies to triumph over him. That is why he's able to praise. Where's the motivation for this song of praise? Because of what God has done in his life. Over and over through this psalm, we're going to see the mercy of God meet David. And David's able to say, hey, I, I recovered. I have a song of recovery here because of what God has done. But verses 4 through 5, it's a call to remember. It's a praise to remember. It, it's a moment here where we can remember what God has done for us. Verses 1 through 3, that's a reframing, a restoring that takes place. But verses 4 through 5, now it's a remembrance. He calls us to remember what God has done. He, he just talked about what God's done for him, and he's saying, hey, sing in verse 4. Sing to the Lord, you faithful ones, and praise His name, for His anger only lasts a moment, but His favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. This is a call to remembrance, a praise of remembrance, a praise to remember here. Can you remember all of the wonderful things that God has done for you? The psalmist here calls the saints that are listening to this to do the same, to think about why they should give thanks to God, to dwell on the faithfulness of God, to really embody this perspective that says, yes, God's wrath, it points us back to Him. It draws us to Him. It, it calls us to repentance. But when we've found faith in God, when we put our hope in God, it's our reminder that His faithfulness lasts for ever. It lasts a lifetime, some translations would say here. That when verse 5 says that we are to sing to God, and verse 4 says to sing to God, and verse 5 says why, 
Verse 6 tells us that we can be secure in that. We can find our security in that. But you, you can't take that jump to recall what's going on in a retrospective way from the past until you've remembered the faithfulness of God. And you really dwell on it. When you've got your eyes fixed on the problem or the situation, the circumstance, you got the horse blinders on. That's all you can see. You're very myopic in your eyesight. What is right in front of you is all you see. But turning to remember what's, what God has done and to praise Him for what God has done, it takes the blinders off. It opens up the sight. You've got more peripheral vision going on. You see things from a different perspective. Oh, I love when it says joy comes in the morning. I love that it says weeping, it's at night, and it feels like it's going on and on and on, but joy comes in the morning. I'd like to share with you a story about my wife Tasha and one of our little girls. Oh, God gave my wife just this insight that she needed for the moment. And maybe some of you have gone through trials and difficulties and we've experienced the faithfulness of God and we can relate to what my wife shared. But man, my little girl was just tired and in tears. And, and it just seemed so difficult and all she could do was dwell on what happened and, and what the consequences of that would be. How that would affect her relationships and her friendships and her future. Oh gosh, it was a hard evening that night. I didn't have any answers. Man, the Lord sure loved giving me all girls in my house. And I'm grateful that he gave me a wife, a helpmate for moments like this. Because sometimes I just don't know what to do. And my wife held my baby girl and she stroked her hair. And with tears coming down that child's face, she just said, Honey, that's why joy comes in the morning. You just need to get some sleep. You'll see how God will rejuvenate you, restore you, and give you hope for the day. Joy comes in the morning because days are tough. The days are difficult. This last week was the longest day in our calendar year for daylight. We're now on that downward slope towards the dark winters. Days are long. They're hard. But joy, it's there for us. It comes in the morning. And when you can stop and pause and rest and lay your head down and put it on that pillow and you can just surrender to God and say, God, I'm going to quit dwelling. I'm going to quit weeping. I'm going to quit crying over this. And I'm just going to go to bed and I'm going to trust you with tomorrow. And then we wake up. And yeah, sometimes we wake up and those days are harder than others. But joy does come in the morning. Refreshment comes in the morning. And that is a reminder to us of God's goodness. We've got breath in our lungs. He's given us another day. There's another opportunity. Joy is available to us. When you've remembered and been restored, it gives you some retrospect. You're able to look on it with an account uh, like a survey, or, or you're able to review what happened. You're able to analyze it. It's almost like you, you've been given the results, and now you can look at the results, and now you know how to move forward. And that's about what David does here. He's got some retrospect. It's a praise of retrospect. He's analyzing the past events, and what he's seeing here is that David was able to draw near to God in the midst of his suffering. So David's suffering actually drove him to God, which was to his benefit. Verse 6 says, 
When I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Right? This just looks like a prideful statement. When I was secure, I'll never be shaken. What a statement. A statement that says, I'm, I'm pretty invincible right now. A statement says, I don't have much to worry about. That's a problem for you, not for me. But verse 7 says, Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain. Like, I know what it's like to have your face shine upon me, which is a metaphor here for God's favor being shown upon you. But when you hide your face, that that's a metaphor for God turning his favor away. And that because of sin, we miss out on God's favor here. That's what this passage is illustrating. It says, Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain. And when you hid your face, whoo, that was scary. I was terrified. And verse 8 says, I called to you and I sought favor from my Lord. See, verse 7 takes us from this place of, I was prideful. I didn't think I needed God. I, I had forgotten that when he shines his favor on me, whoa, I stand strong. Like, that's where this came from. It came from God, not from me. And, and because of our sin, we get distant from God. We turn away from God. We don't experience his blessing because we're swimming in sin. And so there's like a return here that takes place in verse 8. He says, Lord, I called out to you. I called out to you. I sought favor from my Lord. What gain is there in my death if I go down to the pit, verse 9 says. Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your truth? David's appealing here to God on behalf of the very gifts that he has given him in his musical ability to praise God. And he's saying, hey, if I die, if I go to the pit, you know, will, will my dust praise you then? Will it proclaim your truth? It's, it's a begging of God. Like, keep me here. Let me have your favor. I want to continue to use my gifts, talents, and abilities for your glory for the time I have left here on earth. Verse 10 says, Listen and be gracious to me, Lord, my helper. Be gracious to me. Give me what I don't deserve. Help me here, God. This is a, a, a psalm of retrospect. It, it's a praise of retrospect here. It's a, it's a praise of reflection. Like, I'm looking back. And when I did things my own way, it separated me out from God. I needed to be restored back to God. And, and any good that I've got in my life, that's a gift from God. And I want to use it for God's glory here. Verse 10, saying, God reframe things for me. It's this idea of having 2020 vision from the past. You can see more clearly now. So refocus me. He's got some good retrospect here. It is amazing what retrospect does. It turns us back to God. In difficult moments, God draws us back. Whether maybe you're going through a divorce, you lose your job, get diagnosed with a sudden illness, the loss of a loved one. Having some retrospect for that moment reframes it. And it's very difficult to get it in the moment. But that's why you've got to go back to remember God's faithfulness and to reflect on how you've been restored by God. And that this, this very thing you're going through, this suffering that you might be experiencing, that you can call out and say, God, be gracious to me. Give me what I don't deserve here. Help me, God. Help me. I need you. I want the joy that comes in the morning. Verses 8 through 10, that's David's way of saying, I just want to experience that. I'm not done here yet. I don't think you're done with me either, God. 
And I want to renew myself back towards you. I want to recommit back towards you. See, David knew that he didn't deserve God's help, but he cried out for it anyway. And God's mercy and his goodness, it met him there, which leads to the ultimate renewal. The renewal, this praise of renewal that verses 11 through 12 speak of. Psalms 30 verse 11 says, you turned my lament into dancing. Or some versions say, you turned my mourning into into dancing. You removed my sackcloth. You clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. See, friends, when you praise God, it renews you. Verse 11 gives us a couple illustrations of that. It shows us here that God can turn the morning into dancing. He can turn the lament into dancing. Psalm 30 is really a a psalm of praise because of some lamenting that had already happened in David's, David's life. And David chose to sing to the Lord, to praise the Lord in the midst of the suffering, to sing to the Lord in the midst of suffering, to praise the Lord in the midst of the problem. And it is that praise that renews his strength because he focuses in on God. I I believe that we were not meant to ignore the pain in our lives, but to lament in them and to praise through them. I truly believe that, that we weren't meant to ignore the pain in our lives, but that we were meant to lament or to mourn in them, but praise God through them. James will say, Yes, praise God for the trials in your life. It's developing something in you that's going to lead to perseverance and endurance and completeness. So most of us aren't going to welcome God for welcome difficulty that God allows in our lives. We're not going to welcome that in, but we can praise God in the midst of the difficulty because we know that the difficulty can draw us closer to God. We can look forward to the hope that we have found in Jesus Christ because we know that eternally this suffering is momentary, that we will not be sad. We will not be mourning. We will not be crying. We will not be in pain. We will not hurt any longer in heaven. This psalm can teach us that in anything in life that we can turn to the Lord and we can experience His favor and we can praise Him through the pain and praise Him forever. So friends, my invitation for us today is simple. Let us use praise to beat back the heaviness and darkness of life. Father, we come to you, Lord. We thank you that in Christ we can be strengthened. In Christ we can find hope. In Christ we can be made right with God. Thank you for that, Lord, that if any of us are sinners, we can confess that sin to you, believe in Jesus, the one who died on the cross for our sins as a perfect sacrifice to substitute us out for him that His perfect life would cover and take away our sins and, and His resurrection from the grave would give us life eternal. And that as He ascended to heaven, He made a promise to us that He would send us His Spirit and that the God of all comfort can indwell in us and live in us and be with us that will never leave us nor forsake us in the moments of our difficulties and that the very thing we're suffering in and through can be a moment to draw us closer to Him so that He might comfort us. So God, we declare right now that we will use praise to fight back the heaviness of life. We will praise you in the midst of pain. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.
distraught Drink of the water Come and thirst no more Jesus is way